Good morning. My name is Abby. Uh, today's reading comes from the first John chapter 4 verses 7 through 12. Please follow along in your own Bibles or simply listen as the scriptures are read. Again, this is first John chapter 4 starting with verse 7. Following the reading, I invite you to respond in worship with the singing of the doxology. Parents and guardians of children, third grade through fifth grade, you are invited to escort your kids to the back of the room to join Kids Commons upstairs if you so desire. As you are able, we invite you to stand for the reading of God's words. Hear the word of the Lord. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world, so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that lo he loved us and sent his Son to be the proposition for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you for, um, and that's it. Thank you. Sorry. Praise God from Well, good morning. Uh, my name is Matt, uh, not to be confused with Matthew, although my name is Matthew. I did a sermon on that once. Um, my name is Matt. I'm one of the pastors here at Hayville Commons. It's great to see you here this morning and great to worship alongside of you. Um, I would also just like to reiterate that I hope you can join us on Ash Wednesday. We have a really great service planned, and Susan's going to actually share um, some words with us that evening. Uh, and I think that her words will really resonate with everyone that's here. So um, if you're willing to, if you're able and, and can make the time on Wednesday night, I think it'll be really rewarding for your soul and spirit and really connecting you to the healing power of God. So uh, that's Wednesday night, 7 o'clock, right here in this space for our Ash Wednesday service. As we do each week, I want to invite you to pause for a moment with me. In Exodus, Moses told the people of God, the Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. The Lord will fight for you. You only need to be still. So in this stillness, as we embrace it, I invite you to choose perhaps just even a simple prayer that you can pray in your own heart as you open yourself to the Lord this morning. Maybe it's something as simple as, here I am, Lord. Just here I am, Lord. And in this stillness, give the Lord full access to your life. So let's join in this moment together. Here we are, Lord. Here we are. We know that you see us. We know that you love us. We know that you understand where we grieve. You understand where we celebrate this morning. Be close to us today as we seek to understand, to experience, and even to express your love to one another. That's in your powerful name, Jesus, that we pray all these things. Amen. Well, in the early part of the 20th century, orphanages were common in America. These were institutions where uh, children were raised and cared for, children who did not have parents or legal guardians to care for them. But by the mid-20th century, it was clear that children who were growing up in orphanages were getting sick at much higher rates than children other places. The most obvious culprit was germs, right? So to fight the spread of germs, orphanages took steps to ensure that their facilities were clean and their facilities were orderly. And if you walked into an orphanage at that time, you would have been amazed by the cleanliness of the place. Children had blankets and clothes and beds. Children had bright open places to play. They had a lot of toys to play with. Babies and toddlers were moved from one activity to another. They weren't just left alone in their cribs. Everything was safe. 
Everything was sparkling. Everything was sterilized. Everything was sanitized. The floors were so spick and span that you could have eaten off of them. And yet, and yet, kids kept getting sick. So in 1945, Rene Spitz, an Austrian physicist, or an Austrian physician, surveyed American orphanages and discovered that not only were babies getting sick, babies were dying. Spitz learned that 37% of children living in orphanages died before the age of two. 37% of kids living in orphanages died before the age of two, which is a staggering number in an industrialized country. Even those that survived were emotionally withdrawn, underweight, and lagging behind their peers in mental development. Even though everything seemed to be in order, something was clearly still wrong. There was something, something vital to the health and development and survival of these babies and toddlers, something that they needed but that they weren't getting. They were in mortal danger. Spitz concluded that the thing that they were missing was love. Love would have saved their lives. So if you're like rolling your eyes at me right now thinking, <laughs> whatever, webs, love, that can't save anybody's life. Love can't make ba sick babies get better. Well, my skeptical friends, hang with me because it turns out love can do all kinds of amazing things for us and to us. As Marcus preached about last week, love, he talked about the Greek word for love being agape, a word used to try to capture the essence of God's unconditional love for us, like agape love, this immense love. It's wide, it's long, it's deep, it's high, and it's for each one of us. And like many of you, if you were here last week, I was sort of just amazed by the love of God. It was like looking out from a mountaintop peak at a rolling landscape and just being sort of struck by the wonder of God's love. God loves us not because of anything we do, but because of who God is, right? We can't earn God's love. We can't lose God's love. God's love is lavished on us without regard to whether or not we'll receive it. God's love is lavished on us without regard to the cost and the consequences to God. So it's with that amazing foundational understanding of love established in our minds, the panoramic mountaintop view, that I want to take us down off the mountain. I want to stick our hands in the mud of love to examine it on a granular, close level. What does a daily dose of love look and feel like? Is love really the difference between some babies living and some babies dying? Well, the author of 1 John thought love made a huge difference. He had come face to face with Jesus. He had experienced God's love firsthand. In, in his letter to the Ephesians, he urged a fractured community to trust that the unconditional love of God would heal them and to trust that the unconditional love of God would bring them together again. So I want to get into those details this morning. We've spent the last month or so working through our way through 1 John in a series we've called The Gospel in Real Life. And as someone who's been neck deep in the letter for the past month, I must say that John has a very peculiar way, in particular way, of communicating his ideas. Some writers, like Paul, are linear in their thinking. They write in an ordered fashion, systematically taking us from one idea to another idea to another idea to another idea to a conclusion. It's kind of like someone telling you about their Disney vacation with a day-by-day -day recap. Day one, Magic Kingdom, Seven Dwarfs Mine, Caribbean Cruise, Pi or Pirates of the Caribbean, Jungle Cruise. Day two, Epcot, Soarin' Around the World Ride, Frozen Ever After. Day three, Hollywood Studios, Galaxy's Edge. Of course, Rise of the Resistance, Toy Story Land. Day four, Animal Kingdom, and so on, an itinerary. And a day-by-day -day itinerary is a great way to learn about Disney World. But day-by-day -day is not John's way. Instead of working linearly, John presents more of a collage of photographs from the trip. They're not arranged in a super sequential order, but together, taken together, they capture the essence of the trip so that you do get a pretty good sense of what Disney is all about, and then you actually want to go there. The passage Abby just read for us presents some of these snapshots, some of these descriptions of God's love in a collage. And as we look from photo to photo, I want to sort of extract from these photographs a formula for love. Now, I know that love's probably not exactly the thing you want to have a formula about, <laughs> but at least for me, this formula helps me translate John's love collage into something that's a little easier for me to understand, and more importantly, a little easier for me to follow and emulate myself. So love formula. We're going to dive in uh, chapter 4, verse 7. He says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves God has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. So this is the first part of our formula this morning. Love is from God, because God is love. Love isn't simply something that God does. We've said God is, love is something that God actually is. God is other-oriented. God is self-giving love. Even if it doesn't always seem like it, 
which I think oftentimes it doesn't always seem like it, everything God does is an expression of God's love. Another deduction we can take from this is that agape love is something that has to come from God. It's not something that we just have within ourselves automatically. The love we possess on our own is based on getting sort of out what you put in, this reciprocal kind of love. But a love that gives before anything is received, a love that gives even if nothing is received, that kind of love is just wild and different. That kind of love blows our minds because it's so unlike anything we've ever seen before. It doesn't waver. It doesn't give up. It doesn't change. It's not discouraged by our indifference to it. And if we're going to love in that way, then that kind of love has to come from God. It has to come from Jesus in us, helping us love that way in God's way. So love formula component number one, it comes from God. Okay, verse nine. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. All right, so God loved by sending God's son. God's love is something that you can see. God's something that, something that you can feel. It's real, like we talked about in week one. Love isn't merely a feeling held internally for another person. Oh, I love them a lot. It's not just a phrase on a candy heart, right? Love has to be an action done in the real world on behalf of another person. Love isn't just a noun. Love is a verb. It's an action. You got to do love. Quick tangent from C.S. Lewis. He knows that any average Joe will be kind to somebody if they already like them, right? You already like somebody, it's easy to be nice to them, it's easy to love them. Problem is Jesus tells us to love people whether we like them or not. To those who haven't earned it, right? To people who cheat on tests and who cut in line and who say mean things and who make horrible choices. But importantly, we don't actually have to like someone in order to love them. We don't have to enjoy their company. We don't have to feel affection for them in order to love them. And for me, this is actually a helpful sigh of relief (laughs) because that means that I don't have to like everyone. I don't have to, that's right, amen. (laughs) I don't have to feel warm fuzzies for everybody, but I still gotta love them, right? I still have to love them, act in their best interest. I still have to seek their good. And here's the kicker. Lewis concludes that when we love someone that we do not like, over time, our affection for that person will actually grow. When we act lovingly, we begin to feel also lovingly, but it often starts with deciding to do something that we don't necessarily feel at all, but we can still choose to love. So that's our second component of our love formula. Love is revealed through action. Love is action. It has to be seen, heard, felt, experienced, done. All right, keep going. Verse 11, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love God. Wait, wait, Webs, you're wrong. That's not actually what it says, right? And if you're following along, you're right. That's not what it says. You'd think that's what it would say. If God loves us, therefore we should love God. That's logical. But instead it says, God loved us, so we ought to love one another. God loved us, we must love one another. Of course, there are plenty of places in Scripture where we're told to love God, right? It's in the Ten Commandments. Jesus had it in the words of his own mouth that we love God. But... Folks like John, folks like Paul, they never emphasized our love for God. Instead, they say, if you want to love God, the way that you love God is actually by loving people. John explains it in the next verse. No one has ever seen God. No one's ever seen God. But if we love God, then love God, if we love one another, then God's love actually lives and abides in us. And so we've already established this this morning. Let me check the formula. Yep, we've already established that love isn't just a feeling. Love is something that we actually have to do. It's pretty hard to do something for someone that you can't see, right? So because we can't see Jesus, he's not walking around the earth anymore, because we can't see God walking around, we actually have to love the people we can see, and the people that we can see are the people around us. That's how and why we love people when we love God. See Matthew chapter 25. So we can add this to our formula. Where is love? Love is among us. It's like shared between people in our communities. No one has ever seen God, but when we're loving each other with concrete, self-giving actions, God is living here among us in the community of faith. All right, one more component to get to this morning. If we love one another, this is verse 12, if we love one another, God's love abides in us and his love is perfected in us. All right, so at the risk of losing y'all, 
Let's talk about verb tense. <laughs> you ready? Okay, so verb tense. Um, God abides and love is perfected in the Greek are present tense verbs. They're present tense verbs, meaning that's not the past, it's not going to happen in the future, but it's actually happening right now. If we love one another right now in this current moment, then God's love abides in us, lives in us right now in this current moment, and God's love is being made perfect, complete, whole in us right now in this current moment. If we love one another, then God's love is alive among us right now. Present tense. A few verses later in verse 17, we'll read, As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. And the verb tense there is the perfect tense. And in Greek, the perfect tense has the sense of it's happening right now, but it's not limited to right now. It's happening right now, and it also has ongoing lingering effects in the future. So over time, as we live in God, as we love one another, our love will grow and continue in this ongoing process of loving more perfectly being completed in us. So by using these two tenses, by using the present tense and using the perfect tense, John, John is telling us that love isn't just restricted to the moment of Jesus on the cross, this thing that happened in the past, but that love is ongoing. Love is now, and love will continue to happen in us over the course of time. So there's a lot more that we could say about love from this passage, but I feel like we've got pretty good formula so far. Love is from God. Love is demonstrated through actions. Love happens among the people of God, and love happens over the course of time. Which is fine and dandy as a formula, but what difference does it make? Can love really save babies' lives? Well, remember Spitz. At the same time that Spitz was monitoring babies in orphanages, he was also monitoring babies born to women who were incarcerated. And these prison babies did not have the same access to toys and playtimes and sunlight as the babies in the orphanages had, but they did, however, have their mothers. In the orphanage, children were cared for by a rotating group of adults. No one adult was consistently there, moment by moment, taking care of a child. So in the orphanage, a child was not particularly special to any one person. They had all their material needs met, but they didn't have any person showing them love over and over, and over, and over, and over again. Prisoners' babies, on the other hand, spent their days with their incarcerated mothers. Each act of love strengthening the bond between mother and child, each act of love taught the babies to associate their mother's face and touch and sense of smell, or in the scent with safety and with security. They were loved, particularly, and because of it, they thrived. None of the prison babies died. None of the infants raised with their mothers in prison died in his study, not a single one. In fact, the prison children did better than the orphanage children in every single way that Spitz could measure. And over and over, neuroscientists have observed the impact of love in countless settings over the last 70 years. In fact, just on Friday, National Geographic came out with an article entitled, What Happens to Your Body When You're in Love? just in time for me to include it in this sermon. So when people love, when we engage in conversation, when we touch, when we play, when we connect, our brains release seven love hormones that fly through our endocrine systems. These hormones produce feelings of bonding and of attraction and of attachment. They reduce our stress. They improve our sleep. They reduce the pain we feel. One of the most important chemicals, oxytocin, literally improves our brain's ability to critically think and problem solve. Oxytocin literally enables our body to heal more effectively when it's in our blood system. When we experience love, when that love is demonstrated through self-giving actions from a consistent group or person, over long periods of time, human beings will thrive. And when we lose those connections, we will wither and we will even die. You've probably heard stories of someone passing away and shortly thereafter their spouse of 40 or 50 years will also pass away. It's called broken heart syndrome, and it's absolutely a real thing. Turns out oxytocin is an important chemical to improve our heart's health. When someone, has a loved, when someone has been loved day in and day out for 40 years, and then that stream of love stops, it can literally create a cardiovascular response in that person. One study revealed that after the loss of a longtime spouse, people had a 40% higher chance of dying within a six-month period than a married person of the same age. What difference does love make? Love literally heals us. And if we don't have love, it literally damages us. 
When you hear that love heals human beings, how does that make you feel? Surprised? Joyful? A sense of relief? Maybe skeptical still. Maybe even a little bit sad from the things you've experienced. I wonder how many of us this morning long for the kind of healing that love theoretically can bring. You know, we increasingly live in a society of diminishing human interactions. People spend more time with technology. People move from place to place frequently. Families are unstable. There are fewer opportunities to connect with our neighborhoods. We've compartmentalized school, and then here's work, and then here's home life. And we still try to excel in each of those areas to the best of our abilities as if that was the only thing we had on our plate, when in reality we have it all. We're all so much busier and so much more tired than we used to be. And even if we wanted to be more connected, we don't even know how to do that anymore. We have fewer and fewer face-to-face interactions, shorter amounts of time with smaller amounts of people, and it all adds up to a stunning rise in what's been termed relational poverty. We're relationally poor. A Pew survey last October revealed that almost one in 10 Americans say that they don't have a single friend. And the younger you are, the worse that it is. Loneliness has increased among young adults every single year since 1976. 48 years of young people, produ- young people articulating more and more and more loneliness. For as sobering and as scary as all of that is, and it's pretty scary and sobering, everyone who researches loves, everyone who researches love comes to the same conclusion as the author of 1 John. Yes, unloving environments erode our health. Yes, unloving environments destroy our well-being, but loving environments heal us. Loving environments put us back together. One expert put it this way. Healthy relationships with friends, with partners, and family are more important to healing in the long run than pretty much any psychological treatment or medication. Let me say that again. So healthy relationships are more important to healing in the long run than pretty much any psychological treatment or medication. Love was the healing medicine that John offered a hurting, suffering, withering community in Ephesus. God's unconditional love, revealed to us in Jesus, infused in each believer by the Holy Spirit, demonstrated in exchanged acts of love with other people over long periods of time. That actually can heal us. And that's exactly what the church, what this body of Christ is supposed to do. That's what we're trying to do. How are we doing at that? I mean, I think at best we're a work in progress, right? I cling to what we read earlier in verse 17. As we live in God, our love grows more perfect. We're not there, but as we live in God, our love grows more perfect in him. It's a process, baby steps taken over long periods of time. And I'll say that I have a lot of hope. Over the past few months, I've had more than one person say, after being here for like a few weeks or a few months or a year or so, that their overall sense of the place is that it's healthy. This feels healthy. They've experienced you as healthy. Not perfected, not completed, but healing. The more that we love one another as Christ loves us, the longer that we love one another as Christ loves us, the more consistently we love one another as Christ loves us, the more that we will keep healing one another. And I truly hope that you've experienced healing in these places, in this space with us. I truly hope that you've experienced healing here, that you've felt loved here. I think some healing happens in these big sanctuary settings. I think some healing can happen in this space as we gather together, as we sing together, as we worship together. And I think that's especially true if some of your wounds have come from things that have been said or not said from the front of the church by pastors and church leaders. I think it can be especially healing if you've also experienced some things that have been said or not said by pastors and church leaders when they're not in front of a church, just spoken to you. So I think some healing can happen here in this space if it's a different environment, right? A loving and healthy environment here. But I also think a great deal of healing happens in places that are in the in-between moments, not here in the sanctuary. And if we don't experience healing, if we're not experiencing love, it's probably because we're missing one of those elements of our love formula that we talked about earlier. Maybe we're not actually among us very much. We're not close enough to other people. We keep our distance. We stay kind of on the perimeter where it's a little safer. 
we're here, but we're not as fully here as we could be. Or, or maybe we're missing the time piece. We're not among us for long enough. We're pretty conditioned by society to seek instant results. And when something doesn't happen right away, when we don't find exactly what we're looking for, we bounce out. We bounce out of a friendship, out of a church, a community, and we do that over and over and over and over and over and over again before healing can actually take root. Maybe one of the reasons we're not finding connection, the connection we seek, is because we're not willing to put in the time and effort that it takes to make those connections. Love takes time. Or maybe we're short on the actions part of it. We aren't engaged in those hundreds and hundreds of acts of tangible love exchanged between people. But there are a lot of people here that you can love. Maybe even over the next 40 days of Lent, you can identify a few people and find a few ways to love those people with your actions. In fact, maybe for the season of Lent, instead of just giving something up and not doing it for 40 days, you would actually take something on and decide to love somebody well for 40 days and sort of see what happens. One way you can do that is by expressing gratitude to that person, by telling someone that you're grateful for them and something they do. Compliment them on something that deserves recognition. Thank them for a specific thing they helped you with. A few days ago, David Rameau sent me this text message with a passage of a book underlined in the text. And it said, you do this well, bro. Blessings. Salute emoji, heart emoji. (laughs) And I'm still feeling the love five days later from that. Maybe you know screens aren't a great way for you to connect, but I think phones still make phone calls. I think coffee shops still have tables that you can sit at, some of them. You can still express gratitude face-to-face with a person, too. Express gratitude is one way to show love. Or you could offer support. You can check in with someone and let them know you're there. I'm here. I, I offer it. Do you need any help any, this, with this week with anything? Maybe it's to deliver a meal. Maybe it's to drop off a gift. Maybe it's to watch the kids. Maybe it's to help shovel the driveway. Offer to hang out with them and listen to how they're doing. The other day, Michael offered to help me install some new brakes on my minivan. <laughs> and that's love. <laughs> let me tell you, that's love right there. <laughs> Finally, you could ask for and accept help from someone else. Open up. Let someone know that you're having a hard time. Ask someone else if they'd be willing to listen to you. Dan, I'm in trouble, man. Will you be willing to give me a ride to the airport? (laughs) Because I don't know what else to do. Ask for help. Being vulnerable is one of the ways that we love someone else because it puts us on the same level playing field. We all have needs. We all need each other. Asking for help is a big way to be vulnerable and a big way to invite vulnerability and connection from the other person. These actions might not seem like a whole lot individually, but every time we connect with someone else in these ways, we're acting in love. And over time, if we're consistent among our people, then that love will heal us and heal each other. Jesus said in John 13, love each other just as I have loved you. You should love one another. Your love for one another will prove to the world that you are my disciples. Your love for each other will prove to the world that you're my disciples. When we love one another, each act of love is a photograph. And taken together, that photograph creates this grand collage that shows the world Jesus. When we love one another, we are becoming a community where people experience the ongoing healing love of Jesus. Amen.